Hello and welcome guys, my name is Steve and today we're doing 5 Minute Friday where I share my software engineering experience with you. So I was reading this interesting book I bought recently and I found a lot of interesting things. I found a lot of interesting things about the universe. You know what? I didn't find anything about the universe. I was just reading the book for myself. But today we're talking about 10 secrets in Go, things I consider are important, things I consider will improve your life cycle, your lifestyle as a Go developer. So without further ado, let's go ahead and throw in five minutes on the clock. So we're gonna begin our top 10 secrets in Go with slices and specifically we're talking about the difference between an empty slice and a nil slice. So without further ado, let's go ahead and have a look at an example to show you exactly what I mean. So as you can see from my example, we have two types here. We have the people type and the response type and then we try to marshal this JSON and we try to output this to the terminal. So when you run this example, the following lines are gonna get printed and notice here you have items equals null here and you also have items equals null here. And that is because we didn't specify that we want to return an empty slice, we want the items field to be an empty slice. So as you can see right here we just return the response we return an empty response so basically in both cases you're gonna get null as a result in the JSON so in order to avoid that you have to be explicit about the end result so you have to say items field equals to an empty people slice in this case you're gonna get an empty array as you can see right here all right so we continue our secrets of slices and next we're talking about something called slice free index or slice per index what exactly is that and why you should be aware of that so just like in the previous example we tried to create a new slice called people and then after that we try to create a sub slice of that original slice so we all know this syntax we know that the first index is the low and the second index is the high so basically it's gonna try to create a slice starting from index 1 up to index 2 so as you can see here the third index is nothing else but max so basically the third index is gonna determine the final capacity of this sub slice and why exactly we should care about the final capacity because that is not so important it's just the capacity and that's it right so basically if we use only the first two indexes and we run this example as you can see something weird is gonna happen the capacity is not gonna be one but it's gonna be two and also as you can see here the second element of this new sub slice we create has the same address as the last element of the original array. We're basically gonna overwrite the last element of the original array and we're also gonna overwrite the last element of this new sub slice. And that's why it's important to keep that in mind. It's important to limit the capacity of the new sub slice. All right guys, so the next thing we're talking about are JSON struct tags. What are those if you're new to Go? And what are the possibilities when it comes to using JSON struct tags? So as you can see in this example, we have a custom type called person and we have a couple of struct fields. We have name, hobby, email, and money and we have a couple of JSON struct tags. Now when you run this example, you should see something like the following. So as you may already guessed, if you're new to Go, a JSON struct tag is basically uh, a way to instruct the JSON encoder uh, how to encode this specific struct when it comes to outputting it to, uh, I don't know, to JSON. So the simplest way of doing this is by having these backticks, JSON, colon, and inside the quotes, having the name of the field, which is gonna be encoded inside JSON. Now besides this, you could also do something like that, JSON, hobby, for example, and uh, having a comma, and then having omit empty. So basically, Basically, omit empty is going to omit every field in the JSON output which doesn't have a specific value, which has a zero value, if you will. So as you can see here in the second example, we are not using the hobby. Basically, in the first example, we are using the hobby. In the second example, we are not using the hobby. And if you run this example, as you can see in the second line, we don't even have the hobby field in the JSON output. Now, when it comes to numbers and conversion into string, in the JSON struct tags, there is a powerful feature called the string. So if you run this example again, as you can see in all examples, we have money and it's actually a string. It's not a number. So next we're talking about type aliases. What exactly are those and how they differ from custom types? So again, let's go ahead and have a look at an example to show you what exactly I mean by that. So as you can see here in this example, we have a custom type called human and we have a couple of methods attached to this type. So this is how simple it is to create a new type alias. Basically, you say type, you give it a name, you say equal and you specify an existing type. You specify an already existing type. And why is this powerful? Well, because you don't have to basically recreate this type, assign these methods to this type and replace it with student everywhere basically you don't have to do this crap and that's why type aliases are useful so the next thing we're talking about on our top secrets is anonymous structs and empty structs and why i think they are important why i think you should know about them so as you can see in this example it's very easy to create an anonymous struct you just say struct you specify the fields and inside the curly braces you specify the values so basically if you don't want to create a custom type you would usually return an anonymous type and that is a very neat feature when it comes to simple data structures next let's have a look at an example about empty structs and why they are so powerful why they are such a useful feature so as you can see in this example we have to go routines and these go routines try to write something to the channel so they write something to this channel they just write an empty struct 
and then we have a force select construction and inside here we'll listen for that dawn channel and basically if we had like millions of go routines here it would be convenient because that empty struct doesn't take up any space and it would not consume a lot of data between these go routines when they communicate with each other all right so the next thing we're talking about is concurrency and specifically we're talking about the go routines order the order in which you write your code is not going to be the order in which they are run the order in which they are spawned so as you can see in this example it's a very simple example first of all we try to set up the maximum number of threads in which go is going to run and then we try to spawn we try to run two go routines supposedly concurrently so as you can see every time i run this example one and two gets printed that's because we only have go routines on one thread and basically these go routines are going to run one after the other however running our code on a single thread is not efficient and it's not likely to happen so let's go ahead and comment this line so basically when you execute this code now it prints one two two one as you can see the word differs all right so the next thing we're talking about is concurrent safe types so let's go ahead and throw in an example and i'll show you what exactly i mean by that so i'm going to open up my terminal and make sure to run this code of the minus race flag to make sure it doesn't have any data races as you can tell it doesn't have any data races. so as you can see from this example we at least have two ways of breaking this code so basically we have two writes operations right here in the go routines in these simulated http requests and we have one read operation at the end when we try to attempt to read the result so let's go ahead and break in the write operation first so basically inside this function set great we're going to try to comment out this mutic when you run this code it's going to warn you that you have data races and it's going to give you some stack trace and all that stuff so i'm going to try to attempt to read the result right away without waiting for go routines to finish their jobs and this time we're going to have a data race when it comes to reading when it comes to the read operation so as you can see most of the built-in types are not concurrent safe that's why make sure when you run concurrent code you actually protect it from that race next thing we're talking about is shadowing almost everything in go so to prove you what exactly i mean by shadowing almost everything let me go ahead and show you an example of that so as you can see in this example we try to override everything we try to override the make function we try to override the append function we try to override the json and we try to override a lot of things we even try to override the boolean true and that is a variable now so every time we say a variable equals true it's gonna be false and that's weird and try to avoid keywords functions built-ins and all that stuff otherwise you're gonna shadow them and you're gonna have a hard time finding the bug all right so the next thing we're talking about are interface values and why they might be a slight source of bugs and why you should pay attention to them when writing go code so as you can see from this example we have a small function called adult and we basically verify for this int so basically we receive an int here and we verify that this if this is smaller than 18 we return nil otherwise we return response now notice here response or res is a point to person and the value is nil so when you run this program you're gonna see that it's gonna say hey hey you finally got adult when in fact it should print this line but it doesn't print this line because the value and the type are not nil the value is nil but the type is not nil the type is pointer to person all right guys so lastly we're talking about pointer versus value receiver when it comes to type methods and creating methods of a specific type so as you can see in this example we have a type called people and basically it's a slice of string and we have a couple of methods we have have a method called add and we have another method called add ptr so basically add is going to use the value receiver and add ptr is going to use the pointer receivers when you run this example as you can tell the first case which we use the value receiver is not going to work in the second case when we try to append to this slice it's going to work now notice here when we created the world variable we created the people type using an ampersand which means this is a pointer now even this is a pointer and we have a value receiver it's still not going to work so even if it's a pointer it's not going to work make sure whenever you want to update the internal state and that data structure you're working with is not a pointer itself like a struct make sure you add in a pointer receiver in order to update its internal data otherwise just use a value receiver all right guys that is pretty much it on this video and that is pretty much it on this five minute friday so hopefully this wasn't a long video and if it was i'm super sorry for that so when it comes to the 10 secrets in go it was hard for me to pick which one of these made it into the final list so that's why if i missed something where i didn't cover something make sure to let me in the comments below also make sure to check out the video description below because in the resources section i linked up everything that i used in this tutorial several links to useful articles you may read about the topics which i covered and of course the source code and that's pretty much it on 10 secrets in go guys i'll see you in the next video peace